So yeah, I study low dimensional topology. Um, and in particular for me, that's usually four dimensional topology, which is five for big like really edgy. Um, so the main object that I'm studying in this talk is uh, surfaces, smoothly embedded in four levels. Um, but if you don't think about four dimensional topology that often, then I think it's like kind of intimidating to jump right into surfaces and four manifolds. So it's hard enough to think about four dimensional topology in general without thinking about some complicated sub manifold. So let's start by remarking that um, why would I be interested in surfaces in four manifolds? Well, this is sort of clearly a one dimensional up analog of knots in three manifolds. Um, here I have two and four, and here I have one and three. Um, and it's, I think, maybe easier or more familiar to give reasons that you might be interested in knots and three manifolds. There's two very different perspectives here. I mean, people think about knot theory very combinatorially in that theory. I don't know anything about that. Um, but what can we do with knots? Uh, we can describe any three manifold or obtain any three manifold. Uh, by which I mean that's connected, oriented, closed three manifold. Um, by uh, doing surgery on a collection of knots in S3. Where by surgery, I literally mean we have a knot, it's a circle, um, we just delete a neighborhood of the knot, which is a solid torus. That's not for us to do. Probably looks more interesting than that in the three manifold. And re glue uh, S1 for us to do in a different way. So, this operation is called gaming surgery. And this is a very old, well known theorem of uh, Lickerich and Wallace, but this was generated from S3 as a three manifold. Um, so, if you think three manifold topology is interesting, then you should think that knots in S3 are interesting because they're kind of the same thing. Um, and if you don't think three manifold topology is interesting, that's fine. Um, <laughs> But then I don't really know where to go from there. So surfaces of sys of sys of sys of sys of exact same thing. Um, it's a less well known but still really good theorem of Iwase that in fact uh, we can describe any four manifold, which again I mean connected, closed, oriented, um, by doing surgery. On uh, knotted tori, so T twos, it um, it's not going to be S four because here again surgery means that I'm going to cut out a torus and reglue like a thickened torus. Um, so I certainly preserve like the order characteristic of my manifold, for example, um, which in even dimensions doesn't have to be zero. So so I can't really start from S four no matter what. But uh, something really basic, a connected sum of Complex projective planes, the complex projective plane with the wrong orientation, and um, S1 process. So some number of these. Um, from a four manifold perspective, this is like the best possible thing. It's a manifold with a name. Like, what else do you want? Um, so if you think that four manifold topology is interesting, then you should think that surfaces are interesting because we can use them to describe anything. Um, but there's also more subtle problems that don't really make sense in dimension three that we can study with surfaces and four manifolds. So in addition, um, we can use surfaces to understand smooth uh, topology by looking for maybe a surface that's embedded in a four manifold but I can't make it smoothly embedded. So I could try to sort of find a difference in the four dimensional category between like continuous and smooth behavior. Um, we can relate, that's very vague, surfaces to other more interesting ambient structure, um, ambient structures. Like if our ambient four manifold is a, a complex manifold, Manifold, find a like, symplectic subsurface, and come up with surgery operations to change that ambient structure and like study four manifolds that way. Um, and in both the three dimensional. 
dimensional and the four dimensional perspective, something that's interesting is we can use knots or surfaces to understand something about the next dimension up. Um, so in this dimension three, we can use knots to describe cohortisms of three manifolds. I, like if I start with a three manifold, I'm going to build a cohortism from it to a different three manifold. What I could do, so here's my three manifold M3, and it contains some knots inside of it. Uh, Sorry, that's kind of invisible. Oh, they can't see the red. Okay. How about yellow? Visible. Okay, I'll take some three manifold M3, and um, I'm going to find a knot inside of it. Circle, and I'm going to choose. Uh, I'll have to like make a choice of an integer, but I'm going to choose a way to thicken this three manifold the n cross i and attach to this this knotted circle at the end a copy of a disk, which is thickened to be four dimensional. So like this is a disk cross d two. Uh, sort of, it's a disk, and then I thicken it to be four dimensional. So I just thicken it with another disk. Um, so this is attached so that it has this white boundary. Um, so we call this a two handle, and this is literally a picture of a four manifold boundary. Where on the left end I have a copy of my three manifold M, and on the right I have something else. I don't know, just some three manifold, um, and I have this cohortism between them. Um, so we can use knots to study cohortisms. We can try to distinguish four manifold boundary using knots by observing like different behavior of knots in the boundary. Um, so we call this like 3.5 dimensional topology, it's kind of like in between three and four, or three and a half. And we could do something like that with surfaces, um, so I won't write it on the board, but we can similarly use surfaces to describe cohortisms, try to simplify cohortisms, and understand bounded five manifolds. Um, so anyway, that's like the kind of things people think about when they think about knotted surfaces. Um, so this talk is called Knotted Handle Bodies. Uh, a handle body is a solid of genus G. They're three dimensional. It's not a surface at all. So, what is that? So, I'm again going to talk about the one dimension down setting where it's a little bit easier to get started. So, we erase this. We don't actually need this anymore. So, here are just some interesting things in dimension three. Um, so, here's a dimension, uh, sorry, a definition that I think is probably familiar. Definition well, a knot, a circle smoothly embedded in S3 or the image of it anyway. Um, the, uh, let's see. A knot is unknotted if it bounds a disk. Um, so it's an old theorem of uh, Pfeiffer that every knot in S3 bounds some surface. Have you seen this picture before of here's a knot that is distinctly not the unknot, it doesn't bound a disk. But yet it does bound some positive genus surface embedded in S3, which consists of things like deck, 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 Bounding one particular surface. Um, and this is like, you know, a very elementary definition, but something that I think is really funny as a response to this definition, I think I would be really impressed if a student said back to me, is how many disks does the unknot bound, given that it's the only knot that bounds a disk. Um, so here's a less elementary fact. Any two disks uh, fully embedded in S3. I'm not writing the word smooth, but just like pretend I always say it, even though it actually doesn't matter, just makes me more comfortable. But any two disks in S3 with the same boundary are isotopic real boundaries. Where I'll remind you that um, isotopy, so here's my unknot, means that there should be a, a way to deform one disk into the other continuously and like keeping it smoothly and keeping it always embedded at every time. And real boundary means that I never am allowed to move the boundary points. So 
here's one disc bounded by this unknot, it's like a bowl. Um, here's another disc bounded by this unknot, upside down, full. Um, these two discs are pretty clearly isotopic row boundary because I can just take the two discs, keeping the boundary fixed, push its bottom up and up and up until eventually it becomes the other one, right? Um, and so, I mean, that's very clear in this particular example, but it turns out that you can't think of any really complicated disc for the unknot that is like fundamentally different from these two. They're all the same. Um, this is a consequence, very difficult theorem called the, uh, the Schoenfeld theorem in dimension three. So it's like really easy to prove this if you know that theorem, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's easy to prove this because I don't know how to prove that. So I think that's kind of interesting. These surfaces just being characterized by like the type of the surface. All that matters is that it is a disk. Um, and we could ask, well, I mean, that only applies to the unknot. What about like a random knot like this one in a straight line machine is one surface? And so it turns out that without adding more adjectives, if we just consider other types of surfaces, this property fails immediately. So not every um pair of genus G for G positive surfaces uh, in S4 or S3, sorry, with the same boundary uh, are isotopic row boundary. That's particular to this. So uh, here's a very silly example. Again, I'm going to consider the unknot. Uh, but this time I'm going to draw two genus one surfaces with this boundary. So uh, the first one, I'll draw something very simple. Oh, I did blue on the bottom. Let's just keep doing blue on the bottom. So uh, just like my same disc from before, but I attached a little tube to it. Now it's genus one. Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing up here, uh, but I'm going to attach my tube along a more interesting path. This would be great. So this is, again, a genus one surface with the same uh, boundary. So that's sort of like a long tube there. Um, and these two surfaces are definitely not isotopic row boundary. In fact, I don't even have to say row boundary, they're just not isotopic. One way of seeing that is that this uh, surface, the yellow one, um, contains a copy of this knot. I mean, you sort of saw me just draw that knot at the beginning. And this knot K is called the figure eight knot. It has the property that it definitely can't be isotoped to lie on this blue surface. Um, there are sort of basic, not a very typical compute that tell us that, which means there's there's definitely no way I can isotope the yellow to agree with blue, because then this knot would be on the blue. Um, so these aren't isotopic row boundary, but I kind of cheated because these surfaces can easily be simplified. They're what we call compressible. These are compressible. By which I mean, I can find disks um, whose boundary lie on either the yellow or the blue surface. So this is a disk whose boundary lies on the blue surface, where its interior is disjoint from the blue surface. We call this a compression disk. And having a disk like this, whose boundary is essential in this blue surface, gives me a recipe for how to simplify the blue surface, because I could just use it to cut the surface open and decrease its genus. Like, I could just delete this whole thing and go from genus one to genus zero. Um, so this surface is compressible, and so is the yellow one by like, uh, like this. Compression disk. So even though these two genus one surfaces are not isotopic, I could compress them and they would become disks, which would then be isotopic row boundary. So they aren't the same, but they're like basically the same. The difference between them is kind of not interesting. Um, so now we think, are there actually any like interesting examples of different type of surfaces for a knot in S3? And the answer is yes, there are like surfaces that are extremely different from each other. So I'm going to draw a picture, I'm scrolling down because I'm nervous. Um, I'm going to draw a picture of two different cypher surfaces for one knot. Okay, so first I'm going to draw the knot that I want. Um, so I'm not going to draw the unknot this time, I'll draw something more interesting. So like this. Okay, 
that went well. That went well. Okay, no, it didn't. Great. Okay, cool. So here is my non trivial knot. Um, this looks random, but when I start drawing a surface, it'll be clear why I chose this because it's like instead of bound a nice surface, I want to draw two surfaces for it. Um, and I don't want to try to draw them in one picture because that'll be really messy. So let me just draw like the same knot. It's easier to draw once you already got it, right? So just pretend these two pictures are identified with each other. Great. Okay, so I'm going to try to draw an orientable surface with this boundary. Um, to make sure it's orientable, I'll use two colors like I did here so that there will be like a front that's yellow and a back that's blue. That's how I knew that was orientable. Um, so first, for surface one, I'm going to take uh, three yellow discs, two of which are these like bygones here in the picture. Um, and the third one is this like triangle, sort of like this boundary. Okay, and then I'm going to take three blue discs. Two of these will also be bygones. They're sort of blue to these like yellow discs at their ends. Um, and then one really long blue disc, a long rectangle. Um, that's, or I guess it's a triangle that's stretched out like a, a, a thing. I glue it to the yellow at these ends. Um, so I can compute the other characteristic of the surface. Um, I glued six discs together. I glued them together in neighborhoods of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. Um, and it's orientable with one boundary. So this is genus one. This is abstractly a torus minus. Um, okay, so now I'm going to draw another surface with the same boundary. Um, so I'm going to temporarily add two new boundary components just because it'll make it easier to visualize. So here is a circle that links my, my white one, and here's another circle that links my white one. And so I'm going to start drawing the surface starting sort of at this yellow end. I'm going to fill in like a yellow part of the surface, which is going to come through the blue hole. Yellow surface here. And then it's going to glue to something blue. Again, it's just like this long, stretched out disc like before. And now at the end, it's going to go through the yellow hole. So I've drawn a surface whose boundary is my white knot together with the yellow circle and the blue circle. Um, that's not good enough. I don't want these two extra boundary components. So I will get rid of them by uh, attaching a long tube whose boundary is the blue. And it just follows the path of this knot. Okay, so I mean, maybe you can see where this knot came from. Like somebody, Alfred, had a good idea for like sort of two different local models here and just needed like sort of knotted band. Okay. Um, and so again, we can calculate the Euler characteristic of this. This is genus one, P2 minus C2. The interesting thing about these surfaces is that they are not compressible because they're genus one. And I'm just telling you that this isn't to be a knot. We could check like basically any knot invariant. Um, so there's no way they're compressible because this knot just doesn't bound discs. Uh, but they're also super not isotopic for a boundary. Their complements aren't even homeomorphic if they're boundary. So um, uh, I mean, this is like not quantifiable, but these are extremely different uh, genus one surfaces as they're embedded. So, um, in like summary, the question of like how many different genus two surfaces are not found in us three is like maybe a subtle and very interesting question, I think. Um, but I don't really think about three manifold topology that much. I think about four manifold topology. And from that perspective, this is a little bit unnatural um, because I kind of don't like that the boundary of my embedding. Like the boundary of my surface is in the interior of my manifold. Um, for some reason, like that's not what I usually do in four manifold topology. So instead, what I would find more natural is to view S3 as the boundary of the fourth wall. So here's how I always draw this is S3, like this plane sort of at the top, and it sits above like the fourth wall below it, like so it's like a half plane. I don't know. Um, and right now I just have these surfaces. Totally floating around in the boundary. But 
But once you think about S3 as being a boundary itself, you could just take the interior of the surface and push it down just a little bit. Um, so I will push the interior of a uh, sigma or my surface into the interior of the four ball. Um, and now my embedding is, is proper in the sense that the boundary of my surface is in the boundary of the manifold. So boundary surface and boundary before, whereas the interior of the surface is in the interior of a So if it's someone interested in four-dimensional topology, this is like more likely where I would study the surfaces. Um, and it's kind of nice when we look at this example, these two surfaces are not isotopic in S3. But if we had a fourth dimension of freedom, it's actually really easy to show that these do become isotopic. Um, the point is that, like, I can't turn the yellow into the blue because sort of roughly this tube is knotted, right? Um, I could turn yellow into blue if I could just change a crossing, like here maybe. If I change this so that this part was in front, then maybe you can see that this kind of like knotted part all goes away. I can just isotope and make it look standard. Um, and in S3, I can't, I can't do that. I can't just change a crossing, like the surface would run into itself. I'm not allowed to do that in isotopy. But if I had a fourth dimension of freedom, then I could take this part of the surface that looks like it's in front, and first I'll drag it in the fourth dimension that you can't see, and then I'll push it backwards. And since it's somewhere else in the fourth dimension, that won't make any intersections. And then I can bring it back, and I'll actually change that process. So um, it's like a relatively easy visualization exercise. Like if you're just sort of starting to think about four dimensional topology, that um, surfaces are isotopic, even raw boundary. And I'll just say in the core, by which I mean when their interiors are pushed into the core. Um, but what's more surprising is these two surfaces, which look like they don't have anything to do with each other, I think, um, these are also isotopic raw boundary um, when you push the interiors into the core. Um, and from this perspective, I just like do not believe you should be able to see why that is true, because I certainly can't tell you something as simple as that. We have lots of different ways of describing surfaces and hormonal folds, and there is a perspective from, from which this is like easy, but you'd have to like understand surfaces first to be able to do that. Um, so this is this is a theorem. I think this is this is due to Chuck Livingston. Uh, and, and, and multiple decades ago. So people have thought about this for a while. Uh, I don't remember which decade it was. And the, so in fact, it's an open question, which I think is really interesting. Oh, sorry, it's not. Because uh, I want to leave this up for a while. So open question that I do not know how to answer. Uh, does, uh, uh, yeah, does there exist a not Uh, founding two genus G surfaces, which I'll just call um, S1 and S2, so that these surfaces are not isotopic real boundary, even when you push them into the four ball. So all of the examples we have, like this, um, either we know, like these for sure become isotopic, or we at least can't obstruct it. Um, we're not very good at obstructing isotopy which is for either. So I, I kind of think the answer is yes, this should exist, and we just don't know how to prove that we actually have an example. But I also don't have a suggested potential example. Um, so I, I heard this question from Peter Teitner at like a sort of a running seminar dur during the last like year and a half. Um, but I, I don't think it's like originally due to him. I think it's not like originally due to anybody. I think it's just something that people have thought about a lot. I don't know who to attribute this to. Um, anyway, so that's the situation in dimension three. What, what about if S1 and S2 are different? So if, if what? S1 and S2 are different. Oh, well, uh, if, they're, if they're discs, then they have to be isotopic even in S3. No, discs can be formed. Oh, sorry, I, I'm, I, I should have been more careful. I mean, genus G in S3, oh, oh. my bad, yeah, sorry. I mean, specifically, we're looking at cypher surfaces pushed a bit into the four ball. Right, if they're, if they're just 
arbitrary surfaces in the four ball, they certainly don't have to be the same. Uh, yes. Um, so, so that's the other reason why this is hard. There's, there's very little algebraic topology to get hope to use because the surfaces are very trivial. They, they're boundary parallel. They can be isotopes to lie in the boundary. So like I know a lot about their complements. Um, their complements have infinite cyclic fundamental group. Like, so I, I have no idea how you can distinguish them. Um, okay, so that's the open question that I don't know how to answer. Um, it's kind of, a, it's like a 3.5 dimensional problem. So instead I'm gonna tell you about 4.5 dimensional topology, but this is like the motivation maybe. So now let's go into dimension four. So in dimension three, the first thing I said to you was the, the, the definition of the unknot, right? So I better start with that. So um, a genus G surface, uh, which I guess I'm always going to call surface S in S4, is unknotted if it bounds a candle body, by which I mean a solid of genus G. Maybe you've seen it called that. Uh, in S4. Um, so it's very easy for me to give you examples of unknotted surfaces and more complicated for me to give you examples of, of knotted surfaces. So uh, like here's the unknotted sphere, right? It's just literally think about the two sphere living in three dimensional space and three dimensional space is like a cross section of four dimensional space, right? So I, this is like sort of literally in four dimensional space. And then same thing for arbitrary genus. Um, okay, so this is genus three. Now, usually I tell myself that um, it takes too long to draw a knotted surface, but I'm giving another talk tomorrow, so I don't like have to like prove anything today, really. So I think I can tell you, like, here's an example of a knotted surface, maybe you like that. So first, remember, how do we draw a knotted knot? We, we draw an immersed curve, right? Like, really, this is an immersed curve, and I strategically broke the surface, or sorry, broke the knot, like the lead of little intervals at, at double points. And you, like with your depth perception, perceived that as like one piece is behind the other. Um, so we're very good at that, because like that's how we see anything anyway. Um, it's a little bit harder when I'm trying to draw dimension four, but saying that like verbally gives, gives us an idea of what we should do. I should draw an immersed two-dimensional thing and then delete neighborhoods of the intersection points. Okay. So I'm gonna draw an immersed two-dimensional thing in R3. Um, so first, here's part of my surface. This is like, uh, like a, a, light, a light bulb. Oh, that, that's controversial. This is a light bulb uh, with, with one boundary. And then I'm gonna draw like a, the same thing upside down, so like a vase um, with another boundary. So this, so far, this is an immersed surface with two boundary components. Um, and then I'm gonna glue the two boundaries together by attaching a tube to this boundary. Like, um, think a tube with like sort of little holes at the, like, like a tube sphere where I've cut little holes at the north and south pole out, like a fat tube. So like this. Okay, so this is a picture of a surface. It's immersed in a, an R3. It's, it's a tube sphere. Um, and it intersects itself in three circles. Um, there's one here, and there's one here, and there's one here. Okay, and so at each of those circles, I'm gonna delete like a neighborhood of the circle in one of the two pieces. Uh, so let's do the circle first. I'm gonna keep this piece solid, but I'm gonna delete a little annulus here. And we have to understand that that means that this piece of the surface is deeper in the fourth dimension. Okay, and I'll do this at this circle too. So I'll keep this one solid and I'll delete a, uh, an annulus here. Uh, and then finally the last circle. So keep this one solid and delete a circle here. Uh, and okay, and so this is, is somehow literally a picture of a, of a, a sphere embedded in four dimensional space. Um, I'll just say that like the same way we're very good at computing like kind of old knot invariants. Like if you give me a knot, I can give you a presentation for the fundamental group of its complement. Same thing here. Um, this, this two sphere is extremely different from this one because they're complements of different fundamental groups. So this guy is definitely not unknotted. Um, it does bound some three manifold, just like how knots do, but it doesn't bound a it doesn't bound a ball. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's just like a point of interest because I think everybody should see see 
one picture for once. That's the best picture I could draw. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we actually like fortunately don't have to care about this, which is good because this is literally the smallest possible amount of surface and it's very difficult just to get through it, right? And it turns out that in this dimension, even unnuts are interesting. Because remember, I asked a question um, about knots in S3. They bound a disk. How many disks do they bound? Well, what happens if I ask the same question on knotted surfaces in dimension four? So, question How uh, many candle bodies? Uh, does an unknotted surface have? And so uh, there's an obvious way of producing a very different handle body with the same boundary uh, in this dimension, which is maybe kind of funny. Let's consider just the unknotted genus one surface. So uh, I'm drawing it in S3, which is like a cross section of S4. Um, and this unknotted surface. It bounds two handle bodies just in this picture. Like if you've seen Hagar splittings before, this, this is like a Hagar splitting of S3. So um, this compact looking region in the middle, this is a solid torus, right? So this is like a handle body. Um, and the complement of it, um, which remember is compact in S3, is also a handle body. Um, this is like H prime. Um, and these two handle bodies are quite different from each other because, well, in this yellow handle body, I have a curve uh, that bounds the disc into the handle body. Um, and in the blue handle body, I have some other dip curve that bounds the disc in the blue handle body. Uh, these, these curves are not the same curve. Um, this yellow curve certainly doesn't bound the disc in the complement here. Um, so there's no way that H and H prime are isotopic real boundaries because they're not even homeomorphic real boundaries. I guess three manifolds with identified boundaries are different, even though they're both kind of trivial right now. Um, so uh, for positive genus, eat, there's lots of um, like homeomorphism real boundary class, classes. Question of like how many of these there are is actually answered by Guillermo Ferroste, which is kind of what I'm talking about tomorrow. Um, so there's a lot more than two, but there are definitely lots. Uh, okay. okay, so um, fine, but that's not that interesting. What if I like don't want to allow such like a cheap obstruction? And, and so then we come to a really cool theorem from uh, like two years ago by Dave Dubai and Ryan Ludney. I think we have a lot of talks about this theorem and it spawned several uh, sort of papers and conferences and stuff, although like obviously conferences all got canceled, but theorem, uh, let me goodbye. There exist uh, three laws, B1 and B2 uh, in, S4 with the same boundary, but they are not isotopic real boundary. Compare that to the three dimensional setting. I said two disks with the same boundary are isotopic real boundary, and that it was a consequence of the Schoenfeld conjecture. Although I didn't tell you what that is, but um, this is this is not this is related, but it doesn't like disprove Schoenfeld or anything. In case you would know to ask that it doesn't. Um, but uh, this is, I think, really amazing because, well, the boundaries of these guys are two spheres. So it's not like we can use an obstruction like this. Um, these two three balls are definitely homeomorphic draw boundary. So it's got to be something way more subtle. Um, and the upshot is that, yeah, it's actually like extremely subtle and very difficult. They parameterize a three ball with this kind of line, but basically true as I cross B2, and they get uh, an invariant, which this is being re recorded, so like um, this isn't exactly true, which is sort of in uh, I 
two of like an embedding space of an interval in a something. So like this is I cross D2, it's like sort of a two to two parameter family of intervals. So maybe it makes sense why you would look like pi two of some space of, of intervals embedded somewhere. Um, that's very vague because this is a hundred page paper and I I don't want to say anything that's not true. Like, I, there's no way I can say what these are. Yes. Um, but that's that's one thing to say is like, I think this is a very difficult construction. I can't believe that they did it. Um, another thing that's interesting, given all those cipher surfaces that I showed you at the beginning, is that even though these two three balls are different from each other, they're not isotopic in this core, um, D1 and D2 uh, become isotopic. Uh, when you push their interiors into the five ball, when interiors are pushed into B5. So it's exactly like what happened in dimension three. We have some like really complicated, I erased my surfaces, but some kind of really complicated three balls. Um, they, they draw like sort of schematics of what they look like. I won't try to do that on the chalkboard because they're quite large. But once you understand the construction of the three balls, it's very immediate to see that they become isotopic in D5. Um, it, it's more like my, it's more like this example where we can easily say why it should be. Um, so uh, because of this first property, like the invariant goes through writing the three ball as I plus D2, it's quite particular to three balls, right? It won't work for unknotted surfaces of positive genus that don't bound three balls because we can't parameterize those, those bounded three manifolds of products like this. Um, so in fact, I just posed it as a question. Question but why um, do there exist uh, for all G genus G handle bodies, which are uh, embedded with the same boundary, homeomorphic real boundary. So uh, more similar than these two that aren't isotopic real boundaries. And in fact, uh, I'm saying question, but I, they might have posted as a conjecture and I'm just like not remembering how to while writing. So conjecture, like handle values should exist. Um, so that's the theorem that I proved with Mark and someone like two years ago, at least for genus uh, greater than one. Genus equal to one is like always the thing of existence in this dimension for some technical reason, but um, theorem of uh, whatever your last name is, uh, these guys. Um, theorem, there exists for all G, at least two, there exists a uh, genus G, handle bodies, in an S4 with the same boundary, and homeomorphic cell boundary, uh, but they are not isotopic cell boundary. And the really funny thing, or I don't know, the thing, but like obviously I was like happy about this. Dave Kibar is my PhD advisor, so I was like, yeah, I get to email him. Um, but uh, the really funny thing is that the obstruction is very different. It's 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 much easier. Like we're much we're much lazier than like Dave Kibar by one year. It's like I don't know how they did that. <laughs> um, but because it's so different, um, it's actually able to abstract something a little bit different. And in fact, these handle bodies don't become isotopic even when you push their interiors uh, into the five ball, um, which I think is really weird because that means that we have answered the one dimension up version of this question. Um, or like, I don't know, if you were going to reasonably pose this question one dimension up, this is like what I think we would write. Uh, and, and, and I don't know, usually, usually you don't find a bad example of something like, I don't know, somehow like dimension three should have been answered first, I think, instead of dimension four. So like this was the wrong order. So someone should definitely answer this question, but I still don't know how. Um, and like something that I'll just remark is that as G increases, these surfaces are not, our handle bodies are not unrelated from each other. Um, the, uh, Genus G handle body um, comes from whatever the first like genus two pair is. You have to construct some 
genus compare, which is like mysterious. You don't know what these genus depend on look like. Uh, but you get you increase the genus by just adding little solid genes. So I have some like complicated handle body that I don't understand. Uh, I can increase its genus by just you know keep on there. Now it's genus one higher. Do you think you could get examples by taking the bud peak by example genetic relatives? I understand you can't use their variant. Yeah, I mean th that's exactly what I wanted to be true. I mean that was sort of um so while they were writing this paper, I asked. Dave, if exactly that was true, because uh, there was some like other paper by somebody unrelated where they just claimed that two solid tori with the same boundary or isotopical boundary. I was like, that can't be true, but I, he won't believe me unless I have a counterexample. <laughs> um, and so, no, I don't know how to make the, the problem is that the um, our construction sort of starts from somewhere specific, and uh, I don't really even understand what the boundary of these peak results are. I'd have to understand what that surface is first. So kind of kind of hard. <laughs> um okay let's see. So I have another 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna tell you um a little bit about like some facts about like knotted surfaces that would go into trying to construct an example like this. Um quick did you believe that two is the right number or you believe that there are like maybe infinitely many that can't be oh that's a good question too um yeah i don't have a um our construction sort of naturally gives you a pair but i didn't think that hard about how to produce an infinite family um i, th I think there probably should be an infinite family but i don't no, I don't know how you would obstruct it. Um, our obstruction is sort of like a there's a yes or no property, and like one pair has it and one pair doesn't, you know. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, some observations of uh, observations are that. Well, like first I wrote this theorem as if it's a theorem in S4. So the end conclusion was in B5. And like, I think topology gets harder as you go up dimensions. So if we're gonna like end up in B5, we better start in B5. Um, so we should probably understand uh, surfaces uh, as in the boundary of B5. And, and, and this is kind of what happens at dimension down, where I told you, like, oh, I have these, these manifolds, these boundaries, these surfaces, but like, really, I should push them into B4. Well, now I can't put these manifolds with boundaries, so I guess I have to push them into B5. Um, but it turns out that surfaces uh, as bounding in B5 behave extremely different from knots. Okay, so here's a theorem. Uh, which you may or may not actually have the context for. Like I'll have to justify that, but theorem of Prevert is that every two sphere smoothly embedded in the four ball bounds a three ball, uh, a B three smoothly embedded in B five. Oh, so uh, picture like here's S four. I have some two sphere. And I'm saying like US4 is a boundary B5, even though this two sphere is, is probably non-trivial, like I don't expect it to bound a three ball literally in S4. In fact, it definitely bounds a three ball just pushed into B5. Uh, but B3, yeah, it bounds a three ball into B5. Uh, this is like my favorite theory of topology. Uh, if you've seen knots in S3, maybe you know that this is like super not true for knots in S3. The average knot is like a knot bound that's moved it into the four ball. So um, sometimes I give talks about just this theorem, like Michael and I wrote a paper that uses this a lot. And uh, I like to first talk about knots, how important, how bad it is. I like to tell the, under, tell the undergraduates like about this group, like so big. And then 
define like the concordance group for spheres and make them guess what that is for trivial. So they like that. Um, so that's nice. And in fact, using more modern technology, we can improve this. Uh, as a consequence of the theorem of um, Iwas, no, what's his name? Hirose, which is what I'm talking about tomorrow. In fact, the three ball can be so simply embedded in B5, it can be taken to have exactly one local minimum. With respect to this height function, it really looks like this picture. Where there's like one point that's the bottom, um, which means if we think about like computing a fundamental group, the complement of this three ball has six like fundamental groups. So like algebraically extremely simple. Um, okay, uh, so that's very surprising. Um, but that gives us a way to construct things in dimension five. Like once I know that this is true, what I could do, so let's say I want to get some three manifolds in B5 that somehow are isotopic to three manifolds in the boundary. I'm going to start off by just thinking about balls. And what I'll do is I'll view S4 as like the middle of the five sphere rather than the boundary of the five ball. So there's sort of another five ball on top, and of course, five ball on bottom. And so if I take my random, not a two sphere, oops, K, I've just told you K definitely bounds some balls, like, well, one down here. And I can just flip it upside down and get another three ball here. And I would get a whole S3 where K is a cross section. And even though this three ball has exactly one minimum point, so this one has exactly one maximum point, when I look at the height function restricted to this three sphere, there are still more interesting, like critical points. We thought about more scary before. I don't really want to try to get into the last five minutes of this book we talk, but um, because this is a three manifold, we expect index one and two critical points where the cross sections of this manifold change from. Whenever I have a setting like this, where, well, I have some three manifold here, and it is embedded in S5, and it's embedded in a very symmetric way, but I don't care about symmetry. I care about the function, the height function being nice. And right now, it's actually not that nice, because I have all the index one and two points that are down here, and then I have them again up here. So they're not in order. Like, usually, I would want them sort of all the ones at the bottom and the twos at the top. So. Whenever we're in a setting where we just have something that's embedded, it's kind of natural to isotope our embedded thing. So here's my S4 again. To be a little bit nicer, so here's my S3. Um, and still have one minimum and one maximum. But now intersect the S4 in a positive genus unknotted surface with two handle bodies. And these two handle bodies, I'm just claiming, have the property that they are isotopic to ones that actually lie in this S4. Um, so this is like the idea of our construction. We start off with like just some S3, it's embedded in S5. That's what I meant about sometimes when I think about five dimensional topology, but in a very lazy way. Um, and this was okay starting from any two sphere we wanted. And I'll just say that there, there's some way that we can use like some cool theorem of Daniel Riverman, which I'm also going to talk about tomorrow, to understand something about this S3 and say that as long as K is complicated enough, so if K is interesting, then 
then this three sphere is interesting. Um, and in particular, this three sphere will be so interesting that it won't bound the ball inside of the S button. So I have my interesting three sphere here, which is not the boundary of the ball. But if I isotope this so that the middle looks really simple, like an unknotted surface, then in fact, well, there's like two different handle bodies bounded by the surface. They're the ones I drew earlier in this talk. They're like, if I think about this in three dimensions, I have sort of have literally this handle body and like literally the complementary handle body. And if I glue those together, I get a very simple S3, one that is, it does bound the ball in B5, S5. And so somehow I have two S3s and I have two handle pairs of handle bodies where on the bottom, these two handle bodies are homeomorphic rel boundary. And on the top, these are gonna be homeomorphic rel boundary. But the union here is interesting and the union here is not. So it can't be the case that like this pair is the same and this pair is the same. So, so one of these pairs is the example in the theorem and there's like a symmetry section that both are. Um, so that's my, that's my advertisement for like, uh, like tomorrow in the geometry seminar, I'm gonna tell you how to, um, I, I'm gonna talk about isotopies or diffeomorphisms of the unknotted surface, which is surprisingly interesting and how to ensure that this S3 is interesting. Um, and then how to actually like find, why I can actually say that these are homeomorphic. Okay, but that's, that's a good